It is now time for member statements. The member from Perth, Wellington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, last Thursday I was pleased to attend the United Way Perth Huron's Spirit of Community celebration. This event celebrated our local volunteers who contribute so much to our communities. Thursday event was also host to a very special announcement. The United Way Perth Huron raised over $1.15 million during this year's campaign. It's the most they've ever raised in one campaign. I would like to recognize the campaign co-chairs, Police Chief John Bates and Wayne Smith. They did outstanding work. I would also like to offer a special thank you to the residents of Perth and Huron counties. Your outstanding generosity funds the United Way's important community initiatives. We're fortunate to be part of a community that supports local needs and is so willing to give back. To Ryan Erb and the United Way team, thank you for everything you contribute to our communities. Your leadership means a great deal to, to so many great causes. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, this past weekend, 15 communities across Ontario, including my own community of London, participated in the Steps for Life walk. The walk raises money for Threads of Life, a national organization that supports families grieving in the aftermath of workplace fatality, serious injury, or occupational disease. The London walk was opened by Dave and Barb Gerber, who spoke from the heart about the loss of their 25-year-old son, Kyle, who died after a workplace injury in 2008. The Gerber story and the stories of thousands of injured workers that were shared on April 28th at the National Day of Mourning is a powerful reminder to all MPPs about our obligation to do everything possible to make Ontario workplaces safe. We need to ensure proper training and oversight. We need to hold employers to account when they fail to protect workers, and we need to provide workers who are injured on the job with the support and respect they deserve from WSIB. Speaker, as NDP critic for post-secondary education, I once again call on the government to address the lack of workplace protection for one particular group of young people, that is, post-secondary students who are doing a voluntary, unpaid work placement as part of their program of study. These students currently fall through the cracks of the Employment Standards Act and the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act. If they are injured or killed during their work placement, they are not covered by WSIB. Speaker, with Ontario's high rates of youth unemployment, unpaid voluntary work placements provide many post-secondary students with their only opportunity to gain work experience. We cannot fail these students. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statement, the member from the Republic of Senate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, earlier today I had the privilege of hosting a seniors advisory group meeting in my riding of Etobicoke Centre. Once a month, I host seniors from our riding at the Eatonville Library to discuss important issues impacting our community and, and residents of all ages. And over the course of this past year, we've welcomed knowledgeable guests from the community and beyond and have covered a range of topics relevant particularly to seniors. And I'd like to thank those guests who come to speak at my seniors' advisory group meetings. In November, we had Bobby Greenberg speaking from the Mississauga Halton CCAC. In January, we had Lisa Thompson from MTO talking about safe winter driving. In February, we had Denise Harris from the Etobicoke Historical Society talking about Etobicoke's history. Um, in March, we had Michael Burgess from 22 Division talking about frauds and scams. And in April, we had Graham Webb from the Advocacy Centre for the Elderly talking about elderly abuse. And today, we had Ted Rouse, a retired financial planner, talking about financial planning for seniors. These meetings, Mr. Speaker, provide important information to the seniors who attend them and invaluable feedback to me as their representative here at Queen's Park in our community. Today's meeting was our last before the summer, and I want to thank everyone who's participated in the last few months and convey how deeply appreciative I am of their time and the feedback they've shared with me. Their insights have made an enormous difference in my first year and has made me a better MPP. Of course, we will all have a chance to catch up again at my annual Seniors Tea, which is taking place in June during Seniors Month. Ontario's theme this year for Seniors Month is Vibrant Seniors, Vibrant Communities, and I can't think of a group that theme describes more accurately than the seniors that I meet every day in Etobicoke Centre. I'd like to thank all Etobicoke seniors for all you do to keep our community vibrant. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Lampton. Speaker, I rise today to inform the House of a very important event taking place in Sarnia-Lampton, May 5th and 6th, the Sarnia-Lampton Research Park. Bowman Centre will be hosting the big debate, a high-energy discussion of what to do with our nation's wealth of petroleum resources, refine it or sell it. The program for this two-day event 
brings together compelling issues of pros, refinery investment, and sarnia Lambton, adding value to oil sands bitumen, national and provincial economic impacts, and the evolving manufacturing potentials based upon the energy sector. The moderator will be Jeffrey Simpson of the Globe and Mail. Participants, Dr. Jim Stanford, CAW, and the Professor Andrew Leach of the University of Alberta will debate the following resolution. Be it resolved that the provincial and federal governments in Canada should take proactive measures to encourage greater refining and processing of Canada's petroleum resources within Canada that would occur through private market decisions alone. Mr. Speaker, Sarnia Lampton has a long and storied history as the hub of energy procurement in the province of Ontario in the industrious Great Lakes region and is the perfect setting for a detailed discussion of the importance of the oil industry to Ontario and Canada's future. I look forward, to, Mr. Speaker, to attending this very important event and hope that this government will soon commit its support to the Sabre petrochemical project in Sarnia Lambton. Thank you. Have an outstanding member of Thank you. An MPP. Member statements. The member for Tomiskimi Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. Often member statements are used to talk about culture, and I'd like to talk about something about the culture of Northern Ontario. And one of the things very important to our culture is the moose hunt. People, you know, come together over generations, and it's it's one of the most pivotal parts of our culture. And sadly, it's part of our culture that might die, and not because of lack of interest, but because of the management of our moose harvest. And as you know, it's done with uh, lottery with moose tags, and in some of our units, tags have been dropped by 90 percent. And no one is more concerned about the number of moose and the long-term health of the moose population than hunters. And hunters want to work with the MNR to ensure that the moose population is stable and growing. But in the budget, I again see that there's been a cut of $15 million to the natural resource management programs. So they're going to focus on their core. Do you realize, Speaker, in my area, there's an area of 50 townships where there's only two conservation officers. It's impossible for two conservation officers to manage 50 townships. And also in Unit 29, they're supposed to do aerial surveys every three years to be scientifically credible. The most hunting pressure in the province is Unit 29. They did it five years. Again, I urge the government to actually work with Northerners to ensure the future of the Mahusan. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. And we're standing the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the 100th anniversary of the 2nd Battalion Irish Regiment of Canada and to congratulate them on receiving the freedom of the city from the city of Greater Sudbury. The freedom of the city is an ancient, ancient privilege. It is granted by a city for a specific military unit to march through the city with bayonets fixed, colours flying and drums beating. The Irish Regiment of, uh, Regiment of Canada, based out of my riding of Sudbury, was granted freedom to the city on October 15, 2005. They will be holding their parade in Sudbury on Saturday, May 9th, in Tom Davies Square with a reception and a dinner to follow. The regiment, Mr. Speaker, formed on October 15, 1915, and its members have served in a number of campaigns, including World War II, the former Yugoslavia, and peacekeeping missions in the Middle East and Afghanistan. And I think it's very important that I also acknowledge Warrant Officer Gaetan Roberge, Mr. Speaker, who made the ultimate sacrifice and was killed in duty in October of 2008. Mr. Speaker, since they moved to Sudbury in 1965, the 2nd Battalion Irish Regiment of Canada has been an integral part of the community. They've been helpful in the food bank. They pick up all of the food for our, our food bank campaign during Christmas. They participate in festivals, and they're involved in many other aspects of our community that is so important. The 80 to 100 reservists paid of the Sudbury, and many veterans of the Irish Regiment call Sudbury home, and we'd like to congratulate them again on their 100th anniversary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Right Mr. Senator, the member from Leeds, Brentwood. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Speaker. It's with great sadness that I rise today to uh, pay tribute to a longtime friend of mine, uh, Bob Huskinson. Uh, Bob passed away last night, and I join everyone in uh, mourning this outstanding gentleman, uh, one of the City of Brockville's great citizens. Uh, Bob was a former mayor and a former member of council. He was actually a giant on council. He was uh, larger than life. Uh, his uh, passion was uh, unrivaled. And his dedication to the citizens of Brockville spanned uh, an incredible uh, 26 years. He was uh, the longest and continues as the longest public service that anyone had in the history of uh, the great city of Brockville. 
Uh, speaker, it was an honour for me uh, to uh, serve with, uh, with Bob Huskinson for, uh, for three terms, uh, nine years. He was one of the first people, actually, that I went to see as a 21-year-old uh, who wanted to seek uh, the office of Mayor of Brockville. And I can remember uh, going to his uh, kitchen uh, with his son, who was a longtime uh, friend of mine. Uh, and I was wearing my high school uh, football jacket. And uh, he asked me if I owned a, a sports jacket or a suit. And I said, I, I actually own both. And he told me that uh, I should hang the uh, football jacket up and uh, make sure that I wore my suit or my sports jacket and uh, was presentable when I knocked on, uh, knocked on doors. He gave me some uh, incredible advice during that uh, first campaign that I had as a, as a young person. Uh, knowing Bob would uh, be in his seat uh, at a council meeting, ready uh, to, uh, to serve and ready to tackle the issues, he was uh, one of the most uh, well-prepared politicians that I, I ever met. Everyone that I've ever served with uh, on uh, City Council uh, for those years, and even those after, said that uh, he always was so prepared. He always did his homework. He taught me uh, the understanding of uh, looking at both sides and uh, trying to, uh, to seek a compromise, but always making sure that I felt in my heart it was the right thing to do. Because, you know, Speaker, if he didn't think it was the right thing to do, there was no way you were ever going to sway Bob Huskinson from the view he had. I, I was proud to call him a friend. I was proud to uh, spend many summers uh, at his cottage in Charleston Lake as a young person with his family, proud to, uh, to know his, his family and his extended family. And I just want to take this opportunity to extend to his wife, Janice, and his sons, uh, Craig, Rick, and Rob, their families and their extended families, my deepest sympathies. Bob was a great man, and we're going to miss him. Thank you, Speaker. Well Thank you. Member Stavis, the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this week is the beginning of Music Week, uh, with more than 4,500 musicians and 160,000 music fans are coming to Toronto to participate in the Canada's largest new music festival, with more than 900 performers taking uh, place uh, in 60 venues uh, throughout Toronto. And uh, the start of Music Week is called Music Monday. It's the world's largest single event dedicated to raising awareness for music education, Mr. Speaker. Each year, hundreds of thousands of students and educators across this great province and, and music makers participate in a simultaneous nationwide concert performance of an original song written by a Canadian artist. Uh, this year's uh, title song, We Are One, was written by 16-year-old Connor Ross, a student at Mayfield Secondary School in Dufferin, Caledon. Connor's song was a successful choice from 200 songs that were submitted across Canada. Music Monday is a great example of how music programs shape young lives and the fun young people can have in making music. I congratula congratulate all the young Ontarians who have been taking part in this uh, year's Music Monday and being part of Music Week right across the province, including Brantford and Eastview, right across the province. Music Week. Thank you. <laughs> Member Statements, member from Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today is a very important occasion. It's an unofficial holiday known as Star Wars Day. May the 4th is celebrated by thousands of Star Wars fans around the globe. And although it is a, a nod to the classic sci-fi movies from the 70s, there's actually a political connection to the first time that that reference was ever made. It was on May the 4th, 1979, the day after Margaret Thatcher became Britain's first female prime minister, that her party decided to celebrate the victory by taking out a half-page advertisement in the Lo London Evening News which said, May the 4th be with you, Maggie. Congratulations. <laughs> Today, the internet allows Star Wars fans around the globe to connect with each other, as May the 4th has become a great grassroots tradition. 
Mr. Speaker, in 2011, the very first organized celebration of Star Wars Day took place right here in Toronto at the Toronto Underground Cinema. And this Friday, in my community of Kitchener-Waterloo at the Centre in the Square, John Morris Russell will conduct the KW Symphony Orchestra in a program titled The Final Frontier, From Star Wars to Star Trek and Beyond. And I'm told that the concert is going to be out of this world. So, Mr. Speaker, whether you spend the day anticipating the newest Star Wars movie that's going to be out later this year, or channeling positive forces to combat evil in the world, however you choose to celebrate, may the Force be with you. <laughs> okay. I thank all members for their statements. <laughs>